Jesus, we ask you to, by your power, to renew our lives, to give us strength in our weakness, and to receive, Lord, our misery, that we may receive your grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. During the Divine Mercy Chapel today, uh, Brother Pio and Tim will lead us in a meditation. And during the meditation, what we're going to do is we're going to offer, as we do in the Mass, the body and blood of Christ, the true God. And we offer him to his eternal Father. And in this prayer, we take, if you will, the victim. Jesus is the victim. And we say this whenever we sing this, when we offer Eucharistic exposition. We sing, O Salutaris Hostia, sometimes, that Latin hymn written by St. Thomas Aquinas, O Saving Victim, the opening words of the hymn. And we're going to offer the saving victim in the Divine Mercy Chaplet to the Eternal Father, asking Him to forgive the sins of the world. And so, as we pray the chaplet, uh, it's very Eucharistic. It's also referring to Jesus as the victim, as the divine victim who atones, pays the price for our sins. Uh, he became the victim for us, the scapegoat. Uh, we placed all our sins on him. And the Father has willfully done this for us so that we can have mercy. He can have mercy on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, we pray, in the Divine Mercy Chaplet, which was revealed to St. Faustina in Poland. And as we recite each bead of the rosary beads of the decades, we remember different moments in Jesus' sorrowful passion. And the brothers will go through a list. And as you, go th as you listen, try to meditate and think about what you see. As you see Jesus, you know, bleeding, the bloody sweat, the agony in the garden, as you see him being flogged, maybe trying to hear the sound of the whips and seeing the blood you know, scattering on the, on the ground. Think of Jesus, how he felt even interiorly, his interior sufferings, watching his apostles betray him, leave him all alone, falling asleep on him. And what the Son of God felt as he saw them falling asleep and leaving him alone. His interior sufferings even included fear and distress. Remember, he was human. He felt fear. He was afraid. He felt sorrow because as the God-man, he saw all the sins of humanity from beginning to end. And he saw those people who after all this work of suffering and the passion would still not want his mercy, but want their own will. And this also caused him pain and anguish and distress. He also felt a mortal anguish and agony and would have even died had the angel not comforted him. Then there was the battle within him. You know, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. So it was obvious that it was difficult for him. It required great heroism. And so it wasn't just an automatic robotic act. It was a choice where he took on pain for us. And this was in his interior sufferings. And not to mention the exterior sufferings. The brothers will go through even what he went through as he was crowned with thorns and nailed to the cross. As he went through the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross, how he fell along the way and scraped his knees. These things remind us of the sorrowful passion. It was a sorrowful passion that obtained mercy for us and for the whole world. We're also going to hear during the chaplet some of the hidden sufferings of Jesus. I got this from a mystic named another Franciscan, Sister Mary Magdalene Martinengo of the Order of St. Clair in which it was revealed to her in the 18th century a number of Christ's hidden torments that were never revealed in the Bible. 
This devotion was approved and even recommended by His Holiness Pope Clement II, who lived in 1730 to 1740. And we still have these hidden torments written down. They include torments that occurred when Jesus was kept overnight in the house of Caiaphas. What happened to him in that dirty dungeon where he had no sleep and was barraged by all these evil men who were probably even instilled by the demons to do these things to him. You'll also hear of some awful tortures that he went through, which we probably we know will never be repeated. So as we meditate on these sufferings, we again, uh, this is not to, you know, uh, be masochistic or, or to desire suffering. It's just to help us to realize what Jesus has done for us. That he's poured out every ounce of his strength and his blood so that we could get to heaven and have grace. Those invisible gifts that God gives to his friends are given through the sorrowful passion of the God-man. And he did this willfully because he wanted to. Uh, it was taught by the church, uh, not with the same level of dogmatic authority as we teach when we teach about the Immaculate Conception or the Assumption, some of these you know, infallible statements, but she teaches with, with her or ordinary authority that all that was needed for us to be saved was one drop of Jesus' blood. Just one drop would have been enough. But we know that Jesus didn't just draw out one drop, he drew off all his blood, even the blood and water that flowed from his heart at the cross. The last amount of blood that he had was poured out for us. So we think about that when we pray for sinners and we look at the Sacred Heart. The Sacred Heart and the Divine Mercy have a great connection. It's the same heart. From that heart flow rays, red and white, Red symbolizing the blood that is the life of souls, Jesus told St. Faustina, that gives divine life to our souls. The clear ray, which symbolizes that which washes away and makes our souls just and pleasing to God. From these rays, Jesus says, if you find refuge in these rays, you will not suffer God's chastisement. You will only receive mercy and kindness. What does the word mercy actually mean? It means goodness. It means generosity. It means that God is giving something to you that you don't deserve. He gives it to you because He wants to, because He is love and perfect love. But it's nothing that we deserve. If we look at the word grace itself, it requires gratitude. It's a benevolence of someone higher to someone lower. And we are much lower than God. And without His grace, we couldn't even live. So, God wants to be kind. He wants to be generous. And so this is what I was talking about earlier regarding when we go to the sacrament of penance, we should have great confidence because Jesus Himself is giving of Himself. He's giving us his, a share in His divine nature. So whatever in us is miserable or weak or faltering can be strengthened by His power. And so everything that's good goes back to God. It's like a circle. It comes down to us and it should go back to Him in thanksgiving. So that there's no obstacle. There's none of really me in it. All God is doing is transforming me. And I'm still me, but now I'm me plus because of Jesus. And so whatever I have in my nothingness is because of Him. And it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Him. And He can take it away at any time. But He won't, because He knows we need it. So, they often talk about the ABCs of mercy. And we know what it means. It means that we have to ask for mercy, not only for ourselves, but also for others. So that others can also receive benefits because of our faith in Jesus. Remember, there was a story in, in the Gospel of a paralytic man. He couldn't get to Jesus, but he had four friends who put him up and carried him, and brought him to Jesus. So sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes our friends don't have the faith, but it's our faith that gets them there and brings them there, that brings them to the Lord. 
So we can ask for mercy for us. And we do. In the Divine Mercy Chaplet, we say, have mercy on us and on the whole world. You can close your eyes and just imagine the mercy of God just covering the whole planet. Everyone. And not just the planet, but the souls in purgatory. Those who are invisible to us and are, are in, in their souls awaiting uh, chastisement and God's justice for their sins, but will eventually go to heaven. So we ask for mercy confidently, knowing that a good God and a perfect God who is very generous and all-powerful has plenty to give. It's only that we don't ask. And I'm just going to, at this point, mention a little section from the, re the writings of St. Faustina just that speak about God's generosity. My great delight, he said to St. Faustina, is to unite myself with souls. When I come to a human heart, in holy communion, my hands are full of all kinds of graces which I want to give to the soul. But souls do not even pay any attention to me. They leave me to myself and busy themselves with other things. Oh, how sad I am that souls do not recognize love. They treat me as a dead object. referring to when we ask for mercy before Jesus in the sacrament of penance. Jesus says, When you go to confession to this fountain of mercy, the blood and water which came forth from my heart always flows down upon your soul. In the tribunal of mercy, the greatest miracles take place and are incessantly repeated. Here the misery of the soul meets the God of mercy. Come with faith to the feet of my representative. I myself am waiting there for you. I am only hidden by the priest. I myself act in your soul. Make your confession before me. The person of the priest is for me only a screen. Never analyze what sort of priest it is that I am making use of. Open your soul in confession as you would to me, and I will fill it with my light. We're a soul like a decaying corpse, so that from a human standpoint, there would be no hope of restoration and everything would already be lost. It is not so with God. The miracle of divine mercy restores that soul in full. Oh, how miserable are those who do not take advantage of the miracle of God's mercy. So we have to ask. We have to ask God to forgive us and also to forgive those who sin against us. And the prayer of Jesus on the cross echoes this. Father, forgive them. This is what he says at every Mass. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Instead of chastisement and punishment, God gives us more time. He's very patient. And then, the B of the ABCs. Be merciful. If God has been so good to us, if God has poured out his whole lifeblood for us, how we also should love one another, as he says, as I have loved you. So we should pour ourselves out in sacrificial life of self-offering. And we do this by deeds of mercy, by words of mercy, and we can always do it by prayer. Again, we listen to the words of Jesus. <clears throat> I demand from you deeds of mercy, which are to arise out of your love for me. You are to show mercy to your neighbors always and everywhere. You must not shrink from this or try to excuse yourself from it. Even the strongest faith is of no avail without works. If a soul does not exercise mercy in some way, it will not obtain my mercy on the day of judgment. 
So we know what these deeds of mercy are. Feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked. Those are some of the corporal works of mercy. Then we have the spiritual works which are just as important because when we meet someone, they also have a soul. So it includes counseling the ignorant, those who don't know the faith, counseling the doubtful, instructing the ignorant, listening to those who are sorrowful. So these are just some of the spiritual works of mercy. And we can always do it by prayer. We can always intercede for someone before the Lord. And this is part of what being merciful is. Sometimes the greatest reward comes by hidden prayers and sacrifices and fasting and hidden works, uh, deeds of mercy that are done in secret. These are the ones that are most rewarded by God because they don't receive any applause from anyone. And finally, the C, we ask for mercy, we be merciful, we also have complete trust. Complete trust means that we know that God is powerful. We know that there is nothing He will refuse us in the merits, through the merits of His passion. It is good for our souls. It's good for someone else. He will not refuse it. And so this is the confidence that we should have as we approach the throne of grace. So to find mercy, to find favor and hope in time of need. So we find this hope and this help in time of need through the sacraments through the Divine Eucharist, through the Sacrament of Confession, through all of the other sacraments. There are many young adults today that have never been confirmed. So they need that sacrament and they need to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit which they receive in confirmation. There are many married couples today that live together without the sacrament of matrimony. We need to bring them to Jesus so that their union can be sanctified and made pleasing to him. So these are all things that we are called to help people to find. And not helping them so much to find things as to find a person, to find Jesus and Mary. So the ABCs. We should ask for mercy. We should be merciful and have complete trust that if there's something that we need to serve Jesus, that it will not be denied to us. But we have to be persevering. We have to ask with perseverance, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, and it will be given to us. We will find it. It will be open to us. I can't emphasize enough the need that our society has and our families have for prayer. We have to make time for this, more time for this, because the temptations in the world and the voices that we hear in the world are so deafening and so strong that unless we have a refuge from all this, we won't be able to resist the onrush of this poison that comes to us that, that soils our souls. So we have to be very persevering in prayer. We have to spend time with it every day to make a discipline of it. We should be spending at least, I believe, an hour a day, at least a half an hour, if nothing else, trying to think about divine things, the eternal things, praying the rosary, doing spiritual reading, visiting the Blessed Sacrament, going to Mass, going to confession, trying to form our consciences in truth and trying to give ourselves strength to resist whatever would, happens when we leave that sanctuary of our family or our home or our parish or our church. So we look to Jesus to help us and we Resolve to take time every day to be with Him, to be strengthened by Him, to be filled with His Holy Spirit. May we listen to His words as Mary, the sister of Martha, did, sat, sitting at His feet, listening to His words, receiving His wisdom, receiving those invisible gifts that we can't acquire any other way but then through prayer and the sacraments. So may we approach this throne of grace today, this person of the Divine Savior and receive from His most sacred heart this fountain of goodness, this fountain of life, this fountain of joy and peace and all the virtues which flow from His sacred heart, which He has purchased for us by His atonement, His vicarious atonement, His taking our place, 
taking the punishment for us, for our sins and those of the whole world. May we receive today this abundant grace. So, with no further ado, we're going to prepare now to recite the Chapel of Divine Mercy. The brothers will lead us um, again in the individual prayers. And if you don't have the prayers, I have a whole bunch of copies up here. The chaplet, the brothers will recite a short little versicle to help us to remember at a particular point in the moments during the, the sacred passion of our Lord, whether it's uh, from divine revelation itself or from these hidden torments that were mentioned to us through uh, the revelation to Sister Mary Magdalene Martinengo.